couple months ago, I promised that I would make a video talking about the differences between exposing, you know, using shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, even though ISO is not an exposure control. <laughs> Basically using your three core camera controls. I've noticed there's a lot of videos on YouTube that uh, talk about videography from a very beginner perspective, but I haven't noticed very many geared specifically toward photographers. I think they get left in the dust a little bit. I think the assumption kind of is, if you know how to use a camera for photography, then you're, you know, already ready to go for video. But there are some big differences in how you use those core camera settings that can really throw you for a loop. You think you know what you're doing and then you switch your camera into movie mode and you try to dial in all your settings just like you would for, for photography. And then when you get the footage back to your computer, you realize it looks horrible. So that's what we're gonna tackle today. I wanna help you understand how the basic camera settings translate over to video mode and also some key differences and restrictions that you need to be aware of when you wanna shoot video. <laughs> Man, it turned out to be a nice, like a almost a perfect day for shooting video up here. Like over here, off to my left, bright skies, but most of the skies over here are all uh, overcast and moody. It's kind of like a giant softbox over the whole world. So it makes it really nice for shooting video because I don't have to worry about clipping my highlights as much, especially when we got this much snow. What a freaking gorgeous day. So glad I tried this spot. Whew. So good, pretty bright. Uh, maybe I'll go to F11. I've tried at least a dozen times to get out into the mountains this winter, but if there's one thing I learned, it's that, oh, oh damn, it's so deep here. Oh. <laughs> there's one thing I've learned is that I have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to Pacific Northwest winters. I've learned that there's such things as like avalanche weather reports. I don't have snowshoes. Even if I did, I don't know how to use them. So if you're new to this channel, you might not know I'm originally from the East Coast and we didn't have snow like this out there. Winters, don't get me wrong, winters were brutal, often much colder than they are here. But uh, you know, you get a pretty decent storm, get eight or 10 or 12 inches, but you can trudge through that. Out here, the snow is like three, four times deeper than I am tall. And there's no way you're hiking through that. So I managed to find a spot that I wanted to scout back during the summer anyway. But in the winter time, they uh, manicure it for snowshoes and cross country skiers and stuff. And that means that even though the snow is like three times deeper than I am tall, it's packed down enough. I can walk on it with my boots and some micro spikes. So that's what I'm out here doing today. Just uh, scoping out this location, see what kind of possibilities it might provide. <laughs> Check it out. There's actually a bridge there. <laughs> That's how deep that snow is. I don't know, I'd say it's about, uh, I don't know, it looks about maybe 15 to 20 feet above the surface of the water. While I'm out here scouting around though, it occurred to me that this is a really good opportunity. I have a photo camera and a video camera with me. I thought it'd be a really good opportunity for me to talk about what the differences are between photography and videography. I know that I promised this a little while ago in a video I made a few months back. So I thought it might be kind of a fun little activity while I wait for the sun to go down a little bit more. So let me find a spot to get set up here. Whoa. <laughs> and uh, we'll tackle that. <laughs> oh no, why did I do that? Here's a good reminder that no matter how experienced you get, you are not immune from making silly mistakes. It turns out that when I got home from that trip, I only dumped the footage from one memory card. So the next time I went out with my cameras, I formatted over the footage from the other memory card. So here's a quick public service announcement to remember to stay disciplined about dumping your footage off your cards, onto your computer, or your backup drives, whatever you use, as soon as you get home, while you're still thinking about it. So. It looks like I'm making this video again. <laughs> I suppose the silver lining here is that I'm getting a chance to make it more organized than it was the first time. The first time I made this video, 
I ended up getting into the weeds on a couple topics. And while I know some of this stuff is stuff you guys want to know because you've been asking me for it, I realized while I was recording the video that I was getting a little bit sidetracked from the original point of this video, which is to follow up on that other video and talk about the core differences between photography and videography, at least when it comes to using your core settings. So I'm going to focus on those differences in this video to help give you an idea of areas that you might need to pay attention to or learn more about as you move from the world of photography into a world that's more of a hybrid video and photo. But if there's a topic you want me to dive into more deeply, make sure you head down to the comments and let me know so I can follow up later. All right, so let's start off with something you might not have been exposed to at all in photography, and that's frame rate or frames per second. Now, there are certain niches of photography where being able to shoot in a burst mode, especially if there's stuff like uh, live sports or fast moving action, where being able to take a lot of photos in a split second helps increase your keeper rate. But even in that scenario, your main concern is how fast can my camera fire off these shots? So is my camera capable of shooting 5, 10, 15 frames per second? And how many images can I shoot before my buffer fills up? Now in video, your frame rate permeates everything. It's a core component component of shooting video. You can't get around it. Video is essentially a constant stream of still frames that are recorded and then played back multiple times a second that fools your brain into thinking that it's seeing motion. Think of one of those old flip books you might have seen as a kid. It's a similar idea. The number of times per second that an image is displayed is your video's frame rate. Now, this is one of the topics I started really getting in the weeds about the first time I recorded this video. So I'll work on a video in the future about how to choose your frame rates and how to edit your footage that has mixed frame rates. And I'll link that video up here once I'm done with it. But for now, I wanted to introduce you to the idea. Basically, it's important to understand that the frame rate you choose can drastically affect how your video looks. And it's really closely tied to the shutter speed you'll use, which I'll cover in a few minutes. So a good general guideline for thinking about your frame rate is that if you're shooting footage that you want to play back real time, you should shoot that footage in a standard frame rate, like 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second. Or if you're in a PAL region, like in Europe, for instance, you would be using 25 frames per second. These frame rates are meant to have the footage played back at the same speed that it was filmed. Now, if you wanna be able to slow your footage down later when you edit, then you would shoot in a higher frame rate, like 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second. Or if you're in a power region, the equivalence would be 50 frames per second and 100 frames per second. When you shoot in these higher frame rates, it allows you to have enough frames per second to stretch the footage out to fit into a standard frame rate. So this means when you play it back, it will play back smooth without being choppy. Now, the bottom line here is that frame rates become a purposeful choice. More frames per second is not automatically better, and in fact, it can often be worse. If you enjoy playing video games, what I just said might seem really weird to you because the video game industry is constantly trying to squeeze out more frames per second for a better gaming experience. So it becomes very easy to think that more frames per second is automatically better, but don't confuse video games with video. They're very different use cases. In video, lower frame rates give a more organic and visually pleasing look. Higher frame rates look smoother, but more artificial and jarring, unless you're going to slow them down later. A standard for a filmic look, or what some people might call cinematic, is 24 frames per second. This is what we're used to seeing movies shot at. Now, before we move on to the next item, it would be a great help if you take a second and hit that like button. I've been starting to see an uptick in comments where people are glad that the YouTube algorithm is finally starting to recommend my content to them. And the like button is one of the signals that YouTube uses to decide whether or not to recommend videos to people. So when you hit the like button, it helps other people find this same information. I'm sure they'll thank you if they could, but for now, I'll thank you on their behalf. Anyway, so I mentioned that frame rates and shutter speed are tied very closely together in video. Now this is the next big difference to understand and the one that will probably cause you the most heartburn. So I wanna take some time to explain this well. So if you recall from the video about using manual mode for photography, we talked about how your shutter speed is not only a creative choice, but one of your primary exposure controls. So you can vary your shutter speed drastically depending on what you need. Now the similarity between photo and video is that motion blur is affected by your shutter speed. But the difference is that in video, motion blur is such a critical priority that it essentially cancels out any ability you have to use shutter speed as an exposure control. And to get the most natural motion blur, you want to adhere to something called the 180 degree shutter rule. 
Or you might hear some people refer to this as the 180 degree shutter angle rule. Now the 180 degree rule is a standard that was brought over from the days of analog motion picture cameras. And film was exposed with a circular gate style shutter mechanism that could be opened up wider or closed down smaller. Now the extent to which the gate was open or closed was called the shutter angle. So if the shutter was set to be open the whole time, it was said to be a full 360 degree shutter angle. If it was set to be open half the time, that would be half of a circle, so a 180 degree shutter angle. If it was open a quarter of the mount, it would be a 90 degree shutter angle, etc. Now how this worked was that the shutter, the gate, would rotate at a consistent speed while the film would pass by at a consistent speed. That would be your frame rate. And this combination of speed of the film and how long this shutter mechanism was open would determine the amount of time that each frame of film was exposed. It would also control how much motion blur was captured in each frame of film and define the cadence of motion blur between frames of film. Think of cadence like how much blur overlapped from one frame of film to the next. Now what the film industry learned over time was that setting their shutter angle to 180 degrees or being open half the time resulted in the most natural looking motion blur similar to what we see in real life. We tend to think that we see things crisply with our eyes, but we actually see a significant amount of motion blur all the time. You can test this for yourself by simply holding your hand up in front of your face and shaking your fingers back and forth. Notice how your fingers appear blurry? Well, this is what the 180 degree shutter rule emulates. It's essentially deliberately making the footage less perfect so that it feels more real. Now, in our modern digital cameras, we don't have a circular shutter mechanism. It's either a physical curtain mechanism or an electronic shutter that turns your photo sights on and off. Now, even with that, some cameras, especially digital cinema cameras, still use the shutter angle convention, but most of us use cameras where we use shutter speed instead. And to leverage the 180 degree shutter rule using shutter speed, we're going to set the denominator of our shutter speed to as close to double our frame rate as possible. So for instance, if I'm shooting 24 frames per second, I would wanna set my shutter speed to 1 48th of a second. Or if my camera doesn't have 1 48th of a second, I would set it to 1 50th of a second. If I was shooting at 30 frames per second, I would set my shutter speed to 1 60th of a second. If I was using 60 frames per second, the shutter speed would be 1 1 20th of a second, etc. Now the reason this matters is if you set your shutter speed too slow, you'll have too much motion blur. And if you set it too fast, you'll remove that motion blur and give your footage a really strange look. And it's not a look that people can always point to and identify, but it feels weird. And this second issue in particular, setting your shutter speed to be too fast, seems to be where most beginners mess this up. And especially if you're coming from photography, this is probably pretty logical. We're used to controlling photographic exposure partly with our shutter speed. And so if we need to reduce our exposure or darken our image, we crank that shutter speed up. And then we wonder why our footage comes out looking all janky. It contributes to a strange kind of hyper-realistic jittery look. And this look can be really distracting to people who are watching your video. So using my hand as an example again here, look how the motion blur appears when I set my shutter speed to double my frame rate. Now in this example here, I've cranked the shutter speed up, meaning that I've made the shutter speed faster. Now look at how my fingers appear all kind of weird and disjointed, almost as if there's multiple copies of my hand in the frame at the same time. And that's because your brain is seeing less motion blur. So it's interpreting each version of my hand separately as opposed to interpreting it as one object that's moving smoothly. Now there might be legitimate artistic reasons why you might wanna break this rule and use a slower shutter speed or a faster shutter speed than you're supposed to. For instance, if you wanted to shoot a trippy dreamlike sequence, using a slow shutter speed can be really useful for that. It'll make your motion blur kind of smear across the frames. If you wanted to shoot some crisp, jarring, real-time action without much motion blur, you might want to crank that shutter speed up to make things feel kind of frenetic and uncomfortable. Think about war scenes like the beginning of Saving Private Ryan, for instance, or the fight scenes in Gladiator. In those cases, a faster shutter speed is allowing us to see more of what's happening, and it doesn't feel as off-putting because things are moving faster and we expect it to feel more jarring. In that sense, you could say it feels more realistic even though it isn't actually realistic. And how your footage feels is really what we're getting at here. That's what's important. Now, another time you might wanna break this rule that I don't actually see talked about very much is if for some reason you wanted to shoot in a higher frame rate and then play that higher frame rate back 
at the same speed in real time, meaning you're not using it for slow motion. In this case, in order to emulate the most realistic motion blur, you'll want to emulate a 360 degree shutter angle. So this would mean you'd set your shutter speed to be the same as your frame rate. So if you're shooting 60 frames per second, you'd use a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second. This would help your higher frame rate footage feel less jittery. Though, if there's even a chance you're gonna wanna slow that footage down, use the 180 degree shutter rule. If you don't, it'll just look really weird and blurry. But the point here is that breaking the 180 degree shutter angle rule should be an intentional choice. The vast majority of the time, you're gonna wanna set your shutter speed to be double your frame rate. But regardless of the creative decisions you make with your shutter speed, the important thing to remember here is that shutter speed is always set relative to your frame rate in video. Now your exposure will change as you change your shutter speed, but now exposure is kind of your secondary concern and motion blur is your primary. So with shutter speed taken off the table as an exposure control, now we have a real problem. <laughs> We've lost one of our only two methods to restrict how light is getting into the camera. What you'll often find is that once you set your frame rate and your shutter speed to be what you want in your camera, you'll usually be pretty overexposed. Now the preferable way of dealing with this is having 100% control over your lighting sources. But what if that's not an option? Well, you could stop down your aperture. Aperture works the exact same way in video as it does in photography, but you still may not be able to get your image dark enough. Plus, if you rely on your aperture, that means essentially you have to throw all aesthetic considerations out the window. Like what happens if we want a shallow depth of field in a particular scene and we also want less light. Now, if you're a landscape photographer, you probably already see where I'm going with this. You already know that we have other tools, external tools to help us control our exposure. But most photographers don't need to worry about this and they might not even know these tools exist. And I'm talking about ND filters here, of course. Now in photography, only certain genres of photography are really going to be using ND filters. But in video, ND filters or neutral density filters, that's what the ND stands for. These types of filters are basically as necessary as having a lens. In higher end cinema cameras, they're even built directly into the camera. That's how necessary they are. Now, for those who have never heard of neutral density filters, they're essentially a tool that allows you to block all light in a uniform way. Many people describe them as sunglasses for your camera, and I think that's a pretty good way to describe it. They generally come in two flavors. You have regular ND filters that reduce the light by a predetermined number of stops. And then you have variable ND filters that allow you to adjust the strength of the neutral density of Effect. Variable ND filters are actually two polarizing filters that they cross polarize and as you turn the filter it changes the amount of light getting in. Personally I tend to use variable NDs for video and regular NDs for photography. And that's because there are trade-offs. Uh, generally speaking, variable NDs are so much more convenient to use because you can adjust them on the fly and you don't have to constantly switch the filters out. But variable NDs usually come at the cost of slightly lesser image quality and some color casting in your footage. And that's just a byproduct of it being too cross-polarized polarizing filters. Now that said, this is one area where you get what you pay for. The more expensive variable NDs usually control their color casting a lot better and use much higher quality glass. So they make a lot of efforts to reduce the negative side effects of using a variable ND. My personal favorite brand right now for run and gun filmmaking is Polar Pro. I'll stick a link in the description to the ones I use, but they're optically very high quality, barely any color cast at all. And they don't get stuck on the front element of your lens when you screw them on like other brands do. Now speaking of, ND filters will usually come in a screw-on lens design, meaning they screws into the threads on the front element of your lens. Uh, but another really common design are drop-in versions of filters and they fit into like a matte box system. And the benefit to a matte box system is it cuts down on lens flare as the light hits the front element of your lens in kind of oblique angles. But the point here is that regardless of which style of ND filter you end up going with. If you wanna create high quality video where you can control exposure and have control over your depth of field, some type of neutral density filter system is gonna be required. Now, something else to be aware of that might be different from what you're used to in photography is that your ISO might act differently depending on what settings you choose for your camera. I almost didn't add this part to the video because there's such a wide variety of differences between different camera manufacturers and even between different model cameras from the same manufacturer that it really does make talking about this in any kind of comprehensive way impossible. 
so I don't want you walking away feeling like I was being nebulous, but I decided that ultimately it's better to at least point you in the right direction of what you might need to research about your particular camera manufacturer and particular model of camera. But the overall idea here is that you need to be able to adapt to using your ISO in different ways for video than you're used to doing it for photography. And there are a few potential reasons for this and I'll describe them at a high level. Now, the first reason has to do with how your camera might record scene luminance and color spaces differently in video than it does for photo. And again, this will depend on the settings you're using, but I'll give you a pretty common scenario here. When you first decide to start getting into video, you're probably just gonna be shooting with standard out of the box video settings, which will include the kind of default color and luminance settings. But you'll very quickly start to see some limitations. And video will seem a lot more like the equivalent of shooting JPEG instead of shooting RAW. You'll come to understand just how much more limited you are with video when it comes to adjusting things like exposure, dynamic range, and color. You will not have the same ability to push the image around like you're used to in photography. So you'll probably pretty quickly start looking for other options above and beyond the out of the box settings. Now in video, the vast majority of cameras can't shoot in RAW. Now one big reason for this is that video requires a much higher data bandwidth. So compromises have to be made in order to shovel as much data to your memory card as possible. So instead of getting raw data that you'll be able to work with later, some amount of camera processing is always going to be baked into your footage. Now the next best thing for video when you can't shoot in RAW is using something called a logarithmic gamma curve. You might hear people refer to this as a log picture profile or simply as shooting in log. Now it's not as flexible as shooting in RAW, but it's a whole lot more flexible than just shooting in your standard out of the box picture profile. Now, different camera manufacturers have different flavors of log. And so there's a lot of nuances to working with different types of log. Not all log is the same. But the basic idea here is that the camera pulls as much data as it can off the sensor, and then it compresses it into a logarithmic curve before it writes it to your card. So even though your camera is still processing the footage, these log profiles are focused on preserving as much of the tonal range as possible so that you can get increased highlight and shadow detail. They also allow you to fill in wider color gamuts, and that's gamut not gamma. Think of gamma as your luminance and gamut as your color space. It also help you translate it from photography to videography. Now what this means is that shooting in log will make your footage appear straight out of camera to be really dull and lifeless. It'll be really low contrast, low saturation. So in this way, it's a similar idea to kind of the flat, dull, lifeless raw files you get out of your camera in photography. Just with log, <laughs> it's even more noticeable. Now, putting aside the fact that this means you're gonna have to learn how to color correct and color grade your footage, something that often throws people for a loop is that your ISO settings might appear all out of whack compared to what you're used to. To give you an example, I'm shooting right now on a Sony camera in one of Sony's log profiles, S-Log3. Now, the base ISO for this camera is 100. Pretty standard stuff, right? However, Sony specifies that S-Log3's base ISO is always eight times higher than the equivalent in your photography ISO. So on this particular camera, when I shoot an S-Log3, my base ISO is 800, not 100. And these are things you're just gonna have to research and memorize for your specific camera. But you can start to see what I mean here. ISO is not an absolute value that applies to both photography and videography. The values are relative and can depend on how you shoot. And it's just something you kind of gotta wrap your brain around. Now, another way your ISO may act in ways you're not expecting or may not have really known about in photography, unless you're in very particular niches like astrophotography, for instance, is that keeping your ISO as low as possible may not always achieve the best results. I alluded to this back in that manual settings video that I made. Now it's not always publicized, but there's a fair number of cameras out there that have what they would call a dual gain circuit or a dual native ISO. That's another way to say it. This is one reason why in that video where I talked about using manual mode for photography, I was so particular about making sure you understood what ISO actually is, not what people say it is, that it's a gain control, not a sensitivity control. Now in cameras that have dual native ISO, the gist is essentially that the cameras have different circuits that handle 
different ISO amplification stages. Now on one circuit, the lower gain circuit at lower ISOs, this circuit typically prioritizes maximum dynamic range. And the second higher circuit typically sacrifices a little bit of dynamic range and changes a little bit how dynamic range is distributed for the sake of an improved signal to noise ratio, meaning a cleaner image. Now what this looks like practically is that as you move up through the ISO range, you'll hit a certain ISO value where the image suddenly appears to get cleaner. And obviously this probably goes against pretty much everything you've ever been told about how ISO works. Now, as I said, most photographers are blissfully unaware about this rabbit hole application of ISO. And most photographers don't really need to care. But in video, you'll find that a lot more videographers care about this issue. Because in video, the problem of noise is exacerbated because that noise is moving randomly around the screen and you can see it in a moving video. Whereas on an image, it's just static. And noise is also a lot harder to address in video than it is in photo. So you find that videographers care about this a lot more because it's just a harder problem to address in video. And you want the camera to do as much heavy lifting as possible. So my point in bringing up these ISO caveats is really just to call attention to the fact that you might need to readjust the way you think about ISO, at least on the video side of things. And when you get serious about video, these are topics that you're gonna wanna dig into and research specifically for your particular camera so that you can really understand how your camera is working. I know some of you have already asked for deeper discussions on these topics and I do plan to get to them in future videos, but I wanted this video to be accessible to non-Sony users too. And frankly, I'm not qualified to speak to all the nuances of every camera brand because I mostly use Sony. But hopefully for you non-Sony users, this will at least help you get pointed in the right direction. It'll better help you understand what to research and what questions to ask about your particular camera system. Now, if you wanna learn about a tool that I use a lot to help me with exposure in both photography and videography, check out this video right up here. Now, if you already saw that video, then YouTube thinks that you'll like this video down here instead. Or you can watch the top one again, I won't complain. But that'll be it for me, so please let me know if you have any questions in the comments section. And while you're down there, don't forget to hit the like button. But I'll see you in the next video, later on.